Welcome to a new episode in the Multiverse video series. I'm Javier Luraski, and today we're going to learn how you can build shiny applications that make use of Apache Spark. If you're not familiar with Shiny, um, my favorite resource to learn about it is the shiny.rstudio.com website. This video won't unfortunately be able to introduce what Shiny is, but you're more than welcome to explore Shiny on your own. Um, one of the best ways to get started is to take a look at the gallery of applications that you can build using Shiny. So for instance, um, there's a genome browser that um, in this case, it's a Shiny application, uh, old yield from R. So again, we're not gonna introduce what Shiny is in this particular video, that's up to you. But what we're gonna cover is how to build a Shiny application that needs to use Apache Spark. So to build a Shiny application, uh, it's quite easy to get started. You can just say a new file and then do Shiny Web App. And let's just call these Shiny and Spark. And uh, yeah, we can just create these. And the moment you run this application, you get an interactive uh, Shiny application, which is all great. Uh, there's nothing you have to do. Uh, the default application already works, and you can try it out. So what we're going to do instead on this video is we are going to modify this application to use Apache Spark. Now, there's probably several different uh, things that you need to, to consider. If you're not familiar with Apache Spark, you probably want to watch some of our other videos or um, get resources from spark.rstudio.com. Uh, but in general, this should be like a pretty easy and gentle introduction to how to use Apache Spark with uh, Shiny. All right, so the first thing that you have to do when using uh, Spark is to connect. So um, we're going to use the Sparkly R package as usual, and then we're going to connect. Now, when you connect, uh, this is obviously dependent on what type of cluster you're using. For now, we're going to use just a local cluster and specify master equals local. But say if you were running on Databricks or, you know, like just uh, Azure or uh, Google Cloud or why not, uh, depending on your cluster manager, you, you would adjust this for instance on EMR uh, defaults to yarn cluster, so you would change this. All right, so this is this is all things that uh, you're probably familiar with. And um, yeah, so, so this is pretty much it. This is the first step. Uh, so you're connected, uh, you're good. So um, in a real world scenario, probably uh, the next step that you want to do is you want to load your data set. For instance, in this case, the data set that this is using is the faithful data set, which is the uh, geyser data set. And um, uh, what, you would, what you would usually do if you're working with large data sets is you would run something like, uh, you know, we can call this just uh, faithful table. And you would, you, would, you would most likely read it. You would say something like spark read, parquet, and you would load it from your distributed uh, you know, uh, data set that it's too big to fit on a single machine. Um, instead, what we're going to do today, uh, just for the purposes of this video, is just to say uh, we're just going to copy to the data set. So uh, the data set is faithful. We're going to copy it, and that's it. And we're going to copy it into Spark, just to be clear. All right, so we have our data set, which in practice you would probably load in a distributed uh, manner. Uh, using Spark read, the Spark read functions. In this particular case, we're just going to copy it. All right, so we've connected, we've copied the data set. Uh, now, now we need to make use of this actual um, uh, computation, right? Like, I mean, if, if we were to run this application, this would still work, uh, but we're not using Spark for anything, right? So let me just run it. And uh, what is happening here, you can see on the bottom left that uh, it's connecting to Spark 2.3.3. And then uh, the moment it finishes connecting, and why not, uh, basically the Shiny app launches. And now we have the Shiny app 
running. But uh, up to this point, we're just connected to Spark. We're not using Spark for anything, right? So we need to fix that. So how do we fix it? Well, the UI can, can be left unchanged. Uh, there's nothing in particular that I would want to change for this uh, you know, particular application uh, if I were to port this to Spark. Uh, but what we'd want to make use is we want to make use of the faithful table. So here, when we're rendering the plot, uh, as you can see here, we're uh, generating bins based on the UI and this and that. Um, so what we could do here instead would be to use this table. Now, um, Sparkly R supports Deplier and DBI packages. So we need to use Deplier instead of uh, filtering this data set in this way. So just to get a sense of what this is doing, we can just execute it. And as you can see, basically what this is uh, doing is retrieving the second column, right? So if you say call names, uh, waiting. So this should be this should be equivalent to saying uh -oh, to saying uh, select and then waiting, right? Well, actually, we also need the plier, right? If I run this one, uh, we have an error. So the other thing we want to do is we want to make use of the plier. And now if we were to run this again, uh, we are, we can select waiting. Now there's uh, something to consider here. This is actually pulling the data as a vector, right? Which is, is not a data frame. So instead what we can do is use the pool comment from the plier and that gives us exactly the same data set. All right, so now we can replace this. And if we use the spark table, now this is basically will get uh, be executing on spark rather than on um, on R. Let's see. Oh, okay. So each time that we're running the application, we're getting an error that the table already exists. Uh, so just for the purposes of these, we're going to say, we're just going to overwrite this. Uh, whenever the shiny app starts, copy the data and why not? Okay, so uh, now we have the data set and whenever we're uh, changing this, this particular uh, slider, it's actually doing operations in Spark. And we can verify that. If we go to the Spark UI, we have, we're in job 11, nothing is changing, right? Job 11. And if we were to go and change the slider, uh, we can see that we have one more job. Now we are running something in Spark, which is great. That's a great first, uh, first step. Uh, but what is what exactly is going on here? Like if we take a closer look at the code, we are basically retrieving all the data from Spark into R. I mean, in this case, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it's just a very small vector. But if this were to be a real application, real application where we were to be loading um, real data that is um, distributed, and you know maybe there's hundreds of gigabytes or whatever, um, I mean, if the, um, I mean we're reducing the amount of money that we're retrieving to R because we're only pulling one column, so it might work. But this is not ideal because we want to make sure that we force Spark to do as much job as possible for us, uh, and we're still not doing that. So what we want to do specifically would be to say, uh, basically, we would want to compute these, the aggregates of this particular um, data set in Spark and just then create the histogram. Now, um, one, one, way, one way of doing this is to do this manually and rather than retrie retrieving the particular, uh, the, the entire data set, uh, we could uh, create a deployer statements to group by a certain number of pins and return that particular data. Uh, that tends to be tricky, right? Like you would have to write a lot of deployer. Uh, thankfully, there's there's a package by Edgar Ruiz which allows you to create um, histograms and other uh, plots directly using uh, Spark or a database as a backend. So we're going to use that package. The package is called DB plot. And let me just run that. And instead, uh, rather than uh, executing all these directly on Spark, one of the things that we can do is uh, use DB plot. 
So how does dbplot work? Uh, let's just close the app for a second. Okay, let's see a dbplot. And then you can say uh, dbplot histogram. That would be a function that is useful for us uh, for this particular use case. All right, so um, you can see here that it takes the data. It takes uh, x, which is a continuous variable. In our case, it's the waiting um, column. And then the bins and the, bin, the bins width. All right, so we actually should be able to get rid of all of these, right? We can say dbplot dbplot histogram and uh, our table which is a spark table and then you could do uh, your continuous variable is waiting and now we need to choose the bins right so we can say here that the bins are actually just well actually the bins is just the input bins right um, we only need those two and we actually don't need anything else. Uh, we don't need to retrieve the data. We don't need to compute the bins in here, or do we? No, we don't. Uh, we just, um, this, this is part of the functionality that dbplot provides. You give it how many bins you need, and it will basically create a histogram with those. So we can remove basically all of these. And in order to draw it, that's something also that, uh, yeah, we can get rid of, right? So all, all we need to do is basically um, just replace the code that is retrieving the data set and create, creating the histogram by specifying uh, the dbplot package to do the hist create that histogram for us. All right, so this looks good. Uh, they were, uh, we didn't have to perform that many changes, just mostly the connection, loading the data set, and then uh, creating, creating the histogram. Okay, so let's run it again. And uh, again, we have a histogram, and just to verify, we can go to Spark again, and uh, we're in job 16. And we should be able to, whenever we change the histogram, we get a new uh, histogram. But this time, uh, the really, really interesting thing to mention here is that the actual um, aggregation of the histogram is being performed in Spark. So even if you had like a very large data set, um, you would basically be able to execute this histogram without having any, any problems with it. All right, so this is, uh, this is pretty great. Um, we have a very simple Shiny app working with Apache Spark. Uh, so what are the considerations that um, you should consider, I guess, when, when doing this? Well, uh, first of all, is that um, Apache Spark by itself is not uh, does not support natively uh, in a sing in the same connection sharing the connection with multiple users. So this basically means that whenever uh, whenever one uh, shiny user accesses this uh, particular Spark application or shiny applications using Spark, uh, basically uh, they all the users will share the same Spark connection. And, and in a sense, this actually makes sense because uh, when you um, when you use a cluster of computers, you're trying all you are already trying to reduce computation time, right? So if something was taking ten hours or was simply not possible, you might be able to reduce it to like you know like a few seconds or why not? And for that, it basically requires all compute power from the cluster to reduce time and be able to perform computation. So the problem is that if another user accesses if if uh, you know, if two users uh, log into Shiny server and make use of this application at the same time, Spark is gonna be greedy anyways, and it's gonna use all the resources. So it actually also doesn't make a lot of sense to use multiple users in the same Spark cluster because we're already trying to optimize computation, and it's already uh, you know like using as much uh, computation available to that particular connection. So what is going to happen if, if two users come is that they they are going to have to end up sharing the uh, Spark connection. So you know, like in, in this particular application, it's so simple, you know, and it's so fast that you know you probably can have several concurrent users using it, and it wouldn't be a big deal, right? Uh, you know, so basically, if your execution time of your Spark operations, as we can see, is pretty low, you know, it's in the order of uh, milliseconds. Then you know it's not a big deal to share uh, your shiny application with a few users. 
Now, if you have something very heavy and your cluster is not that big and, you know, like you're basically struggling to perform computation, it's taking seconds or even minutes or why not, then what's going to happen when two users come, if uh, this duration time is too long, when two or more users come at the same time and try to perform an operation, they're basically going to be left on hold until the previous operation finishes, right? So in, in, a, way, uh, in a way, Spark is... Spark connections are like a single user, single kind of like thread application, you know, at least from a, for those of you that are familiar with R. Uh, it works kind of like as if, as if you were having a serial application, not, not because it's serial. Um, Spark is fully parallelizable across many machines and many processes, but just by the fact that Spark tries to use as many resources on that particular connection as possible. So the operations will have to get queued. Uh, but but again, a, a great use of um, Spark and Shiny working together is when um, you have a big data set or modeling that is expensive and time consuming that gets reduced in time by using Spark. But you might have some users in your organization that are not Spark users or maybe not even our users. Um, so by combining Shiny with Spark, you can enable those users to... Um, model and do analysis using Spark without them having to actually know um, Apache Spark. And another great way is also to do exploratory data analysis. If you can create a, a UI with a lot of parameters that you know, makes, it, uh, makes it easy for you to explore Spark data, that's another, another great use case. Right, hope this video was useful. It was pretty short, but uh, it's definitely something that a lot of people ask, you know, as in, how can I combine shiny apps with Spark? And this is a hand, this was a handsome video to just help you out, go step by step and give you some baseline on how you can also convert more complex shiny applications and some of the trade-offs that you might hit while doing so. Right, thank you so much.